so good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you. And uh, just to get an idea of uh, who knows what in the room, who here has a legal background? Nobody. Okay, so I can basically say, I can basically say what I want, and you have to believe me. Great. Um, so I hope then uh, lunch was uh, good, and I hope uh, 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 that. Uh, this won't make you uh, uh, regret having eaten before uh, coming to the lecture. The, the fluorescent yellow is a, a way to keep you awake after lunch. I'm hoping it'll work. Uh, so uh, before I get started in my presentation, uh, simply to mention, as uh, I just put up on the screen, that my slides are available on my website, vermaise.com. Don't, so please don't hesitate to go there, but I understand that they will always also be uh, put up on uh, the uh, Serene Risk w website at a certain point. Uh, so if you want to wait and get it from that source, feel free to do so. So uh, my presentation, uh, as you can see, was, is titled From Ottawa to Budapest, and you might be wondering why or oh, why is he talking to us about Budapest uh, in uh, this conference. Well, as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, there is an international convention on cybercrime. I should say an European convention on cybercrime, but that was actually opened up to the rest of the world, and that convention was actually signed in Budapest. So it's the Budapest Convention or the Cybercrime Convention, depending on uh, uh, who you speak to, but it's the same document, and hence Budapest in my title. So the, as we saw with our two panelists this morning, um, Obviously, the, 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 the criminal code is the law that will uh, guide us, if you will, in our search as to how we can uh, uh, attack cyber criminals. Only problem is, if you actually look through that law, if you actually read through the code and its many, many, many dispositions, you'll realize very quickly that there's actually no mention of cybercrime, and therefore no mention, also no definition. And this comes back to the question that uh, uh, this gentleman asked this morning, saying, well, what's your definition of what a cybercrime is? Because it's very difficult to have statistics on cybercrimes if you don't know what they are. We have a general idea of what we consider cybercrimes, but as we'll see in a moment, uh, uh, those ideas uh, often are not uh, uh, relevant to what the law uh, 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 dictates is a cybercrime. The convention, on the other hand, again, the Budapest Convention or the Convention on Cybercrime, uh, obviously uses the word cybercrime. It's right there in the title. It's actually used eight times in the preamble, and uh, it's also mentioned in Section 46 of the law, or of the, the convention, rather. Uh, but again, mentioned a couple of times, but not defined. So we do not, in Canadian uh, legislation or in international treaties that are actually applied to Canada, have a definition of what cybercrime is. That being said, the convention does, in its preamble again, mention uh, what is the focus of the law. And what they say is that basically we're trying to protect the uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of computer data, of computer systems. Therefore, we're working on information security, mostly. I say mostly because there are actually a series of cyber crimes in there, and some that have absolutely nothing to do with security. And I'll get back to uh, that in a moment. So a little bit of background on this convention, since I'm going to uh, uh, get back to it or come back to it a, a few times during my presentation. It was open for signatures in 2001, uh, which means basically it was completed in 2001, and therefore countries that wanted to adhere to it could do so from that moment on. But it actually only came into force in 2004, and the reason it took that long is because in order to come into force, it had to be ratified by five country, countries, sorry, three of which had to be European uh, countries. A uh, difference between uh, signature and ratification, uh, uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with international treaties, and that's going to be my little part on international law, and then don't worry about it. I'll get back to uh, cybercrime. But simply to understand how conventions work, basically when you sign something, it's basically when you go to the store and you're talking to the salesperson and you go, yeah, that's interesting. I, I like that. Uh, I, I, so he says, well, are you going to buy? Uh, let me think about it. I'll go home. I'll ask my wife. And when you come back with your wife's approval, that's ratification. So basically, signing is saying I'm interested in being bound by this document. Ratification means I actually changed my laws. I actually adapted my legal framework in Canada. And now I can actually uh, uh, really apply that uh, uh, convention on Canadian soil. So that's uh, where we are right now. Basically, 47 countries around the world 
uh, have signed that convention. So our, our colleagues from the OPP will actually be happy to hear that now they have, because of this convention, they have 46 countries that they can directly contact and ask for information because the convention actually says that all signing members have to co uh, cooperate in fighting cybercrime. So they actually have to exchange information according to uh, uh, that convention. Uh, so basically 46 other partners with Canada. And this is actually very, very recent. Uh, as I mentioned, Canada signed way back in 2001. So you figure, well, they probably ratified it in 2004. Actually ratified it two weeks ago. So this convention actually was ratified uh, on the 8th of this month. So not even two weeks ago, it was ratified. And what's surprising is that nobody talked about it. And this is important. This is huge as, as far as cybersecurity is concerned. This is probably the most important development of the last few years, including C13, which is a new bill that was referred to this morning that basically modified Canadian laws so that we could adhere to the convention. And so ratified a few weeks ago, but will only come into force in uh, November of this year. So basically, again, my colleagues, my friends from the OPP, you're going to have to wait uh, another uh, couple of months before you uh, call up those 46 other countries for information uh, should uh, you need their help. So if I get back to trying to define what a cyber crime is, well, I basically looking through case, uh, uh, through uh, 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 papers and online journals and, and news clippings, trying to establish what cyber crime is or what people usually consider cyber crime, I made a list, and obviously it's not a complete list, there are uh, other elements, uh, two of them being probably the most important cyber crimes, the first one being child pornography, which we spoke of this morning, um, and the second one uh, being uh, copyright infringement. Child pornography, when you actually look at the case law, is probably over 90% of cyber crimes. Uh, copyright infringement is uh, a little different because unlike child pornography, which is in the criminal code, obviously, as a crime, uh, copyright infringement is actually in the Copyright Act. It's still a crime. There are actually criminal dispositions in the Copyright Act, which is relatively rare when you uh, uh, look at other types of legislation but very rarely used. There have only been, according to case law, about 30 uses of the uh, criminal dispositions of the Copyright Act because, let's face it, when somebody is impeding on your copyright, what you want is damages. You don't really want them to go to jail. You might want them to go to jail, but you mostly want them to pay up. And so not that many uh, uh, cases uh, of uh, cyber uh, uh, crimes related to copyright. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about those two topics, or I'm going to uh, push them aside, simply because, as my title uh, uh, suggested and as was asked of uh, me for this presentation, I'm really going to concentrate on cyber crimes that deal with information security. And in these two cases, it's not a question of information security. It's a, another type of cyber crime. Is but... I will, this list actually I'm going to break down now uh, because some of these elements, and, and you're actually a couple of seconds ahead of me. Oh, that's perfect. That means you're, you're, you're following. Uh, basically, a lot of these elements we would tend to consider cyber crimes, or if you read, again, newspaper clippings, we'll talk about this as a cyber crime, but really they're not. And spam is the first example of that. Uh, people often talk about sp spam as being a cyber crime. But if you actually read the law, if you read the, uh, Canada's recent anti-spam legislation, or if you actually read its official title, I'm going to try to do it in one uh, uh, breath, an act to promote the efficiency and adaptability of the Canadian economy by regulating certain activities that discourage reliance on electronic means of carrying out commercial activities and to amend the Canadian Radio, Radio Television and Telecommunications Commission Act, the Competition Act, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, and the Telecommunications Act. <sighs> That's the actual title of our anti-spam legislation. Very easy to remember. Uh, so that, that law actually states that spamming is a violation, not an offense. And therefore, it's actually not a crime. If it's not a crime, it can't be a cybercrime. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have uh, uh, penalties associated to it, 
but it's actually not a criminal offense uh, under, uh, under Canadian law. And it's actually the same logic under uh, uh, the uh, European Convention or the Cybercrime Convention, where they actually uh, mention, not in the convention itself, they don't talk about spam in the convention, but if you actually go in the explanatory report, they will say that such conduct, therefore sending spam, is actually not a criminal offense or should not be considered a criminal offense unless really it's akin to a, a distributed denial of server service attack. So if you're sending spam will actually cause a system to crash, then maybe you can consider it a crime, but otherwise uh, it is not. It's simply a violation. So that's one thing that we refer to as a cybercrime, which isn't. The second one, and that's probably the one that's going to surprise most of you, is theft of data. Theft of data is not a crime. I thought I would get a lot of jaws to drop on that one, but you don't seem that surprised. I'm a little disappointed, honestly. Uh, theft of data is not a crime, and the Supreme Court actually said that in 1988 in a decision, R.V. Stewart, where somebody basically uh, uh, made a photocopy of a list of employees of a hotel for unionizing purposes. And he was sued, and uh, uh, also criminal charges were laid against him, saying, well, you stole our data. You committed theft. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's not theft. You copied the information, but the information is still there. And in order for it to be theft, you actually have to deprive the other party of the property. So by re reproducing information, you're not actually stealing it. And we'll get back to that in a minute. And the best example of that is a recent case out of Saskatchewan. And it was actually confirmed by the Court of Appeals a few weeks ago. Uh, that was a case of uh, uh, revenge porn. What we refer to nowadays as, days as revenge porn, but this was before C-13, so before revenge porn was a thing. Uh, do we know what revenge porn is? Uh, just for those of you who, not, who are not familiar, is basically my girlfriend just broke up with me. I have a picture of her in her underwear on my laptop, and I decided to share it with the world because, well, I'm kind of mad at her for breaking up with me. So that's the idea behind revenge porn, and that's exactly what happened in R.V. Moore. Mr. Moore decided to get a, a picture of uh, uh, Christine Lee and put that picture up online. So he hacked her computer, went to get the picture, and put that up online. And there were two accusations, both of which mention stealing personal data. So the act of robbing, of stealing, of theft of data. And the court actually said, well, the problem is, in order to prove theft of data, you have to prove, again, that it was taken from her and she didn't have access to it anymore. Whereas if you actually break into somebody's computer, take the information, the information is still there, so you didn't deprive that person. They actually went a step further and said, he put that information online, so it can't be considered theft because she can just go online and download her old picture. So in a sense, you didn't steal anything. It's still available to her. It's still readily available to her. The only problem, it's readily available to half the country as well, which is probably what uh, uh, she did not enjoy. Now, again, this uh, uh, particular type of crime no longer uh, would be prosecuted under uh, theft. It would now be prosecuted under, prosecuted under the new revenge porn dispositions of the law. And I'll get back to those in a few seconds. Uh, but what's odd about this, so basically you're saying if I steal information, but you still have that information, that's not theft. But if I steal your laptop, or if I steal your USB key, the value of what I stole will be calculated by what's actually on that laptop or on that USB key. So if I'm stealing a $10 USB key that has secrets on it that are worth millions of dollars, I stole millions of dollars. But if I go download those millions of those same documents or hack your system and go get those same documents, then I technically didn't steal anything. So this is one case where the law just didn't follow what a common logic would dictate. And uh, this actually came out of a decision of the uh, Court of Appeals in Quebec. Uh, and if you're actually looking at the convention now regarding theft of data, again, theft of data is not in the convention. What you understand reading the explanatory notes is that basically what we consider theft of data is actually two distinct crimes. The first one is deletion of data. So that's a criminal offense. And the second one is interception of data, another criminal offense. So basically what happened is you intercepted the data and then you deleted it. So the result is you have it, they don't, but it's actually not theft 
its deletion and interception. So conceptually, a little different than what uh, uh, we would commonly refer to as data theft, and that has direct implications. Again, in Marer, the court basically said, had you not used the word theft in the accusations, and this is where the Crown prosecutor made a mistake, if you hadn't used the word theft, we probably have, I probably would have convicted him. But you used the word theft, you have to prove theft, you did not, and so you can't uh, uh, actually, I can't actually convict him. It, it is, but then when you're talking about use of uh, intellectual property, as I mentioned, it's a distinct crime. Then it would be under the Copyright Act, it's uh, uploading or downloading or copying uh, intellectual uh, data that is protected by intellectual property. So it's not theft of data, it's a, a, a violation of intellectual property rights under the Copyright Act or under the Patent Act, depending on what type of intellectual property you're dealing with. Now, the next one I would take off the list is what, again, I mentioned, I referred to as revenge porn, which has been added recently to the criminal code. It was added in March of this year and uh, would have been very useful in R.V. Moore. And basically, it's what I just mentioned. You put online a naked picture of your ex. Now, that was actually a disposition that was uh, uh, adopted to fight cyberbullying. Because when teenagers would put pictures up online of their ex-girlfriends, the only real dispositions in the criminal code that applied were uh, 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 child pornography, because they were minors. But you don't really want to accuse a 14-year-old of child pornography when what he did isn't really to get people off who enjoy that type of stuff, but really the reason he did it was to uh, uh, cause a nuisance or bully another child probably an ex-girlfriend or so. And so they adopted these dispositions uh, that deal with revenge porn, and you have basically the definition here on screen, and that can lead to a criminal, criminal offense. But again, not a cybercrime related to uh, uh, information security. This is just a general cybercrime. So when you're talking about cybercrimes that are related to uh, 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 information security while well, you're thinking about these elements. So malware, phishing, spyware, hacking, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously, again, the criminal code did not use those definitions. There are actually three dispositions in the code that we can associate with these types of offenses. And they're the three that we see on uh, screen right now. The first one is interception of communications. The second one being unauthorized use of computer, and I know there, we're missing an A in there, but that's actually how it's written in the uh, criminal code. And the third one is mischief in relation to computer data, which was alluded to uh, this morning. Uh, these same crimes are also in the convention, uh, differently titled. You have illegal interception, illegal access, and data or system interference, but they, again, uh, they're more or less synonyms of the three uh, infractions uh, in Quebec, uh, in Canada, sorry. Um, in the convention, there are seven, uh, or, uh, yeah, seven, I, I, I can count up to seven, which is pretty good. Uh, there are actually seven cyber crimes, according to the cyber crime convention. Child pornography, uh, copyright infringement, the three that are on the screen, and then you have computer-related forgery or computer-related fraud. Now, as was uh, mentioned by our colleagues by, from the OPP this morning, uh, in Canada, computer-related fraud is just fraud. So you basically, you have, you'll have an authorized use of computer or a mischief in relation to computer data, and on top of that, you'll have fraud. So you'll have two different crimes. So it's not considered a cyber crime as such. It's two different elements. So there's no computer fraud uh, uh, disposition in the criminal code. So if I go down uh, uh, these three uh, uh, criminal offenses, first one being interception of communications, uh, that one is uh, mentioned at, uh, se in section 184 of the criminal code. I'm not going to read it. Again, I don't want to put you all to sleep uh, right off the bat. Uh, simply uh, uh, take the main elements out of it. In order to talk about or accuse somebody or convict somebody of interception of communications, you have to be able to prove two things. One, that that person used a device to, inter to, uh, 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 to intercept the communication. So if you're just eavesdropping on somebody, 
that's not the right disposition to use. The second one is that there has to be a voluntary inter interception of a private communication. And if you actually look at the uh, 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 disposition in the convention, again, more or less the same thing. So if you can prove these two elements, you can prove that I use a device and you can prove that I voluntarily intercepted a private communication, well, then technically you can send me to jail or uh, fine me depending on, on what uh, uh, the actual uh, um, crime I committed was. Uh, again, this is the wording for the European uh, uh, Convention. It's use of technological means so, uh, d or a device and inter in intentional interception without right of a non-public transmission. So we said a private one instead in Canadian law. Exactly. A device is actually defined in the Act. It's defined very broadly, which is basically any type of a, a, a device that can be used to inter interfere or intercept a, co a communication. Uh, there are actually some exceptions. For example, uh, in the Convention, they actually mentioned that a hearing aid, although technically a device, does not count. So if you have a hearing aid and you overhear somebody's conversation, you are not a criminal, uh, uh, thankfully. Uh, so. Originally, obviously, that this position was adopted uh, uh, to uh, uh, talk about, and we mentioned it this morning, uh, uh, listening in on phone conversations, whether it be uh, uh, using phone lines or waves. It can obviously be used as well for video conferencing. And uh, most interestingly, the Supreme Court came out two years ago and confirmed that it can actually be applied to uh, text messaging. So intercepting text messaging is also intercepting a communication, so it's not just oral communications, it can actually be uh, text-based. So that's for the, the interception of communications. Second cybercrime, or second category of cybercrimes, if you will, is the unauthorized use of a computer. That's uh, uh, mentioned that sec in section 342.1 of uh, uh, the criminal code. Uh, just so you know, uh, and I should have mentioned it for the uh, uh, interception of communications, these dispositions, uh, probably because, and I'm going to uh, uh, send some very kind words to our, our friends from the OPP up there, uh, probably because the cops are doing their job so well that people will actually plead guilty very quickly, have been tested in front of the courts very rarely. Interception of communications, about 30 instances in case law that mention it. And usually uh, uh, it's because a, a warrant for uh, intercepting data has been obtained by the police and uh, uh, the accused considers that it wasn't the right warrant. So it's not even criminals that are being accused. It's basically we're saying the police officers did not get the right documents uh, to have access to the data. In this case, unauthorized use of computer, uh, if you're actually talking about the offense itself, about 39 uh, cases and almost all of them uh, refer to employees breaking into their employer's system. So people who actually are not hacking the system because they have a pass username and password. So very few cases that actually deal with cyber criminals in the way we think, so hackers and so on. And uh, the second uh, uh, paragraph actually of that, uh, that same section, so 342.1 uh, paragraph 2, uh, actually defines what a computer is, and I'll get back to that in a, sec in a second. And so there are about 100 cases that quote that paragraph, but those cases are almost all child pornography cases where the judge basically says you're not allowed to use a computer to contact a minor, and a computer is defined as it is in section 342. So that's long uh, a side note to say that basically we're not uh, uh, using these dispositions a lot. So one of two reasons, because again, uh, 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 cyber crimes are committed and uh, we don't know about it, or because uh, uh, people will plead guilty before actually making it in front of a judge. So uh, 342.1, 342.2 actually goes on to add that if you uh, build or sell or use uh, uh, appliances or devices, uh, sorry, that can allow uh, a uh, unauthorized use of a computer that is also a criminal offense. So unauthorized use of a computer, in this case, you have to prove that the use of the computer, so you've, you basically got into a computer under fraudulent uh, 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 
uh, means and without a color of right. So those are the two elements in this case that you have to prove in order to send somebody to jail. Uh, under the European Convention, they actually talk about intentionality and uh, uh, the absence of right again. So a little different in the wording, uh, similar, but still uh, uh, the, uh, the differences are important in this case. Fraudulently and without color of right um, is a little more nebulous. And you'll actually, actually see it in the case law where judges don't actually bother to uh, make the a separation between the two. They just say, yeah, that was done fraudulently and without color of right, but you actually don't know which of the two is the element that they focused on. Whereas intentionally and without right, well, those are very distinct categories. But at the same time, something can be done intentionally, but without any uh, uh, ill will or without any criminal intent. And one exam uh, example of that is, a, um, is RV Parent, a Quebec decision, where basically a police officer gave information that technically he was not allowed to give, but he gave it to a private investigator who he believed was basically fighting the good fight. He was investigating to find out about uh, criminals. So he figured, I'm sharing with somebody who has the same mission. So this was done obviously without color of right. It was obviously done intentionally, but it wasn't really fraudulent. So the court decided that he was not guilty of the accusation. A similar case, somebody from the Société d'assurance automobile du Québec, so car insurance uh, 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 society in Quebec, and basically an employee decided to sell information to a, a member of the public. The problem is the member of the public was actually a member of a, a small biker gang that is uh, referred to as the Hells Angels. I don't know if you've heard about them. But back in those days uh, in Quebec, they were not exactly the most popular people. And therefore, that uh, was considered to be not only without color of right, but clearly fraudulent. So it really depends on what your intent is when you're accessing the information. I have a bunch of other examples uh, uh, that we can discuss uh, further if we have the time. And now comes uh, uh, the important part. Obviously, we're talking about uh, uh, breaking into a computer system. Well, what is a computer system? And this comes back to the uh, question uh, you asked this morning about the refrigerator. Is a smart refrigerator a computer system? And the answer is probably yes. You have the definition here on screen of what a computer system is. And it's any device or a, a, a group of interconnected or related devices that contain computer programs or other computer data and that by means of such com said computer programs perform logic and con performs logic and control and may perform any other function. So that's a relatively broad definition of what a computer is. So it obviously applies to your desktop or your laptop, but it also applies to servers, uh, as, as was the case in RV Platier, which is a Quebec decision. Brilliant. This gentleman was fired for I don't know exactly what reason, so he actually broke into uh, the Department of Justice who he worked for. He broke into their system to replace the letter of dismissal by a letter of uh, promotion, and he thought nobody would notice. And so he showed up the next day to work, and obviously it, his scheme did not work, and he was still fired, and on top of that there were criminal ac uh, accusations laid against him. So breaking into somebody's server, a server is a computer. A game console is a computer was a case, uh, 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 RV Hamel, again in Quebec. And uh, for some reason, all the cyber criminals are in Quebec. I don't know why, but I mean, we have in Montreal a very strong uh, uh, IT uh, uh, component. So maybe that's why. I have no idea. Uh, but all that to say, so most cases are from Quebec. And in this case, this was a guy that would uh, pirate X Xboxes. So he would modify the Xbox so it could read uh, cloned uh, uh, cartridges or, or CDs, rather. Uh, I'm old school. I still think of the Nintendo, Nintendo cartridges that you had to blow into. But basically, now the Xbox, their CDs, and you can burn those CDs, but the Xbox won't read, the, read it unless you actually go into it and, and, and modify the system. So he was accused of uh, hacking the Xbox, and it, he was actually acquitted, not because it wasn't a computer, but because technically what he did wasn't illegal. What was illegal was the person who used it afterwards to read a copied uh, uh, game. An, an ATM, uh, RV uh, Siokata, uh, RV Ono's, uh, Alberta cases in this case. Uh, actually, it's the same case. It's just the two co-defendants that, this, this, that asked for a split trial. And they hacked into an ATM. And that is considered a cyber crime or rather uh, uh, access to a computer system. A cell phone... 
has been also considered to be a computer. So again, anything technically that has software in it could be considered a computer. So I was uh, on driving here this morning, I was listening to the French version of the CBC, Radio Canada, and there was actually, and I have 10 minutes left, no problem, and there was actually a, uh, a, a journalist was talking about uh, the cars that are easier, uh, the easiest to hack into. And I believe it was the uh, uh, Jeep Cherokee that was actually the easiest uh, car to hack into. Well, if you can hack into it, that means it contains computer programs and it performs logic and control. And therefore, that car in that circumstance would be a computer system. So you could use Section 342.1 to uh, 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 lay down criminal accusations against somebody who pirates the system of a car. Which leads us to our third and final uh, cybercrime category, and that's mischief in relation to computer data. That is mentioned at Section 430 of uh, the Copyright Act. And um, again, like most other dispositions, two things that you have to prove. You have to prove that the mischief was willful, and you have to prove that it was without right. Now, that's actually not specifically mentioned in the disposition. Uh, it is mentioned in the uh, uh, equivalent uh, disposition in the uh, cyber, law con uh, cyber crime convention where they say it has to be intentional and without right. But obviously, if it's intentional and within right, so if I erase this presentation from my laptop at the end of the presentation, I didn't commit a crime because I had the right to do so. Uh, so there again, very rarely have these dispositions been used. There are only four cases that quote uh, that section of the law, two of which are the Mora case I spoke of uh, before. Uh, so first, uh, uh, the first decision and the appeals decision. So very rarely used. So what are we talking about when we talk about mischief in relation to computer data? Well, the, uh, basically it's everything that has to do with attacking the integrity of data. So it's deleting, damaging, deteriorating, alterating, or, or deleting data. So it's all of these elements. So if you do one of these things, you're willfully, uh, uh, if you do these things willfully and on somebody else's computer, uh, for example, then you're committing mischief in relation to computer data. And the best example of that, and I, I, as a prof uh, university professor, I love this uh, decision, a uh, Koshar v. U of Saskatchewan. Uh, so in this decision, they actually talk about the criminal case that was against Mr. Koshar. Uh, he was unsatisfied with his university grades. And so instead of studying harder and ta uh, taking new classes to bring his average up, he decided to hack into the university's computer system and give himself 17 A's instead of the 17 D's I presume he had or it does just said he changed 17 grades, so I figure he gave himself better grades. Otherwise, uh, he's not the, as smart as he, as he thinks he is. Unfortunately, he got caught and accused criminally under Section uh, 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 430 of the Act as committing mischief to data. But this is one example where the criminal trial is actually not in the case law because it was settled out of court, or rather he pled guilty, I'm guessing, uh, because there's actually no trace other than the fact that that decision was mentioned in this civil trial where Koshar was actually suing the university to let him finish his uh, studies. And the university said, well, we don't really want you as a student here anymore for obvious reasons. So that in a nutshell and in 32 uh, minutes is basically what cybercrime is from a legal standpoint. And that lets you understand a little uh, better why uh, there's so much uh, 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 discrepancy sometimes between what we perceive as cybercrime and what we see uh, in the media as being uh, pers uh, uh, prosecuted by the courts, or in front of the courts, I should say. So I thank you for your attention, and if there are questions, please.